DC Practical 2.1. Dr. Ken with you here, and we're looking at methods of producing an EMF. So the first thing we need to do is a, a risk assessment. And uh, I consider electric shock, burns, trips and falls. I'm going to use direct supervision for each of those things. The risk assessment was somewhere between low and medium. And the way I'm going to control those things is to use only extra low voltages keep any heating of things up to less than 50 degrees C and keep leads etc off the floor. So EMF using electrolytes and electrodes. Basically we're going to use a container containing a solution of water and salt. We're going to use four electrode types of copper, zinc, lead and aluminium and using a multimeter set to the volts DC scale, we're going to place the electrodes in a solution and measure the EMF or the voltage in accordance with the following little table. So you can see here the combinations we're going to uh, do things in. So you're going to see we're going to keep the positive electrode, mostly copper for most of the time, it's going to be copper. Then we're going to use zinc, aluminium and lead and then finally we're going to have a zinc and aluminium combination. So let's get on with our experiment. And you can see here, we have a little container. And you can see quite clearly here, we've got copper, zinc, And the solution in here is salty water. You may see a white object floating in the bottom. That's just a piece of nylon, just to make sure the bottoms of my electrodes uh, don't touch each other. So you can see here on our first reading, we're getting 0.83 of a volt. So quite a substantial um, EMF difference between copper and zinc in a salty water solution. Our next one is uh, copper and aluminium. Again, copper hasn't changed. This one's changed, so you can see this is aluminium. And our reading in this case, 0.573, again, a reasonable potential difference between the two electrodes. Our third one, which was the copper and the lead, and uh, being a avid fisherman, wasn't too hard to find a nice big lead sinker. So there's my lead sinker. and copper and again um, 0.321 of a volt is the reading again still substantial and our final one is our zinc and our aluminium so we've see things have changed a fair bit here so there's our zinc and our aluminium and our voltage, the lowest reading so far at 0 0.263 of a volt. So let's put those all in a table now and you can see that um, the copper zinc is the best at 8.35, the copper aluminium, fair drop in that then uh, copper lead drops substantially again. And then finally the zinc aluminium, the worst case scenario. So 
obviously if you wanted to build a cell a battery of some kind using these kinds of uh, equipment the copper zinc is going to be your best go it's going to offer you the best potential difference or the best EMF so now EMF uh, using a thermocouple effect so this time we're going to take a container of water that's at uh, ambient temperature we're going to submerge, submerge a um, 10 watt 1 ohm resistor as a heater and connect that to a DC power supply so we can get something to heat the water up with we're going to place in the water a temperature sensor a digital thermometer and we're going to put in a type K thermocouple in the water connected to a millivolt meter we're going to turn on our heater which is the resistor and we're going to note the thermal couple readings as the water temperature increases again in the following table so here's our table we're simply going to put degrees C into here five or six readings into here and we're going to also put our EMF readings in millivolts into this side of the table and see if there's some relationship or correlation so here's our first one let's uh, explain what we've got here on the screen so here's our container of water it's just water the uh, long white thing you can see in the bottom that's our heater the blue thing with the thermocouple on the end of it that is the thermocouple so that's the thermocouple and then hiding in the back there on this black lead is our digital temperature sensor so that's that readout there of course um, the type K thermocouple I've just got it going simply into the voltage input and you can see on my multimeter I'm on the millivolts DC scale here so at ambient temperature on the day they did this the ambient temperature was at about 28 C and getting about uh, 0.03 uh, millivolts so it's not many millivolts in fact it's about 30 microvolts so let's now increase the temperature so you can see here the temperature's now gone up to nearly 32 degrees and our reading has gone up to um, 0.07 of a millivolt so the temperature's gone up and our thermocouple reading has also gone up so we go to very warm so we're now up to 35 degrees C and we've we've come right up to 0.2 now 0.2 of a millivolt and we get up to hot at 39 degrees C and we're up to you can, as you can see there 3.4 millivolts and then very hot at pretty close to um, 41 degrees we've now got um, 0.4 of a millivolt or 400 microvolts so putting that into the table here we can see there is a clear relationship as we go from 28 C up to 41 so ambient warm very warm hot and very hot you can see our millivolt reading um, has also increased with that so very straightforward so a thermocouple a TC is a way of producing an EMF and a thermocouple being two dissimilar metals bonded together so what are some of the observations that we've got from this so which electrode combination is best suited for a chemical or a commercial cell I should say 
and that would be the copper and the zinc. I mentioned that a little bit earlier. You got the best potential difference there. The two products, the copper and the zinc, are probably easy to get a hold of. So if you wanted to make a commercial sell, that would probably be the go. What are some of the bearing factors with uh, this type of electrochemical effect? Well, the amount of salt that you've got in the water. Um, there comes a point where you can't get any more salt in the water. The water saturates with salt. So that's a limiting factor. Um, it's also um, terribly reliable on temperature. On a cold day, you're not going to get as much out of it as you would on a warm day. So there's some problems with temperature in this kind of uh, wet cell arrangement. Uh, list some of the places where thermocouples may be used. Well, thermocouples aren't used to produce energy, but that uh, thermocouple effect uh, is used to make temperature sensors. So the thermocouples are particularly good in high temperature situations. Um, the thermocouple I used here was a type K and a type K I think is good for something up around about 1200 degrees Celsius. So very, very hot and very, very cold. So a very wide range of temperatures can be sensed with um, thermocouples for doing temperature monitoring and temperature controlling. 